everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Felt a great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, I got a job for me. Meet me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Universal presents The 7% Solution, Nicholas Meyer's best-selling mystery from the personal memoirs of Dr. John H. Watson. The 7% Solution, revealing for the first time the vile and destructive habit that almost destroyed the world's greatest detective. Sherlock Holmes' most baffling mystery. mystery. Sigmund Freud's most curious case. The year's most intriguing motion picture. There has been no explanation for the 7% Solution until now. Ah, welcome to Everything Old is New Again. Douglas Viviani here sends David Cohen, unfortunately. But I have a very special guest with us this week to uh, sit in the co- uh, co-host chair, if you will. That, of course, is a little reference to 7% Solution, a Sherlock Holmes mystery that was written by our guests. And uh, listen, that uh, our listeners know Sherlock Holmes and, and Dr. Watson are alive and well because we do uh, some characters every so often, tw- at least two, three times a year with them and we visit back to the victorian days with them and bring them along but that's a story for another week this week we are so excited uh and happy to have someone that may have more interest and more fun with those characters than we do uh in fact he's the author of a book and the academy award nominated screenwriter of the adaption of that book and we're talking about the 1976 movie and book the seven percent solution but he's he continues to be prolific and was pr- incredibly prolific since then. I can only mention a little bit of his work because uh, it just goes on and on. We need to have some time to actually talk to this gentleman. But uh, he's the man responsible for uh, the screenplay and the director of Time After Time. He uh, co-wrote, let's say, the uh, and directed Star Trek II, which I would suggest... Uh, resurrected and saved that franchise even to this day on uh, television he was uh, the driving force behind the day after if you remember earned an emmy award a nomination for the best director of pie the pied piper of hamlin from shelley Duvall's fairy tale theater which we'll talk about for a few moments uh, down the line he also was a co-writer of star trek four the voyage home co-writer and director of star trek six the undiscovered country writer of the History Channel recent, relatively recent uh, miniseries Houdini, starring Adrian Brody, and so much more. Uh, his fifth Sherlock Holmes novel is out this weekend, and I've uh, been privileged to be able to read this in advance. i got to tell you, The Return of the Pharaoh combines so many things that I enjoy. Uh, as we know, listening to this show, we've had Bob Breyer on the show and talking about ancient Egypt. So we are mixing Sherlock Holmes with some ancient Egypt, and and there's quite an adventure in the return of the pharaoh. Nicholas Meyer, thank you very much for the third time. Well, it's a pleasure. I I have to say, I believe that you're kind of the perfect guest for this show, because we celebrate entertainment of the past, and we recognize... In some ways, that it serves as the foundation for the even the entertainment of today, and and truly some of the best entertainment today, I think, pays homage to the past and seeks to improve or tell additional stories from older characters or older themes in entertainment in the past. And and I think in some way, uh, your work does always pay homage to the past, but does the best of the best by 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 building upon that, by introducing and and expanding upon characters like H.G. Wells, Houdini. Sigmund Freud, the Pied Piper, and now in the latest book, The Return of the Pharaoh, we get to mix in with Howard Carter, who was the one that discovered King Tut's tomb. So I guess I would start off by asking you, do you kind of agree with the the premise of our show and the thesis with respect to giving a nod to entertainment of the past uh, while producing new works, maybe using that as the foundation? Well, the short answer which I'm not famous for, short answers, um, (laughs) is yes. Um, In my opinion, to expand on the idea, the thesis behind your show, I think all art is a history of cut and paste. And we all build on what has gone before. I'm not sure that we necessarily build better, but we certainly, you know, 
It's interesting. I, I lately have a sort of bee in my bonnet for having some of my books uh, discussed in a pejorative context as being, quote, pastiches. And I have to say, if, the, if my thesis is correct, and the whole history of art is a history of cut and paste, what are the Odyssey and the Aeneid but fanboy spinoffs of the Iliad? It's the same characters, and they have more adventures. Uh, so I think, um, you know, in a sort of, t to make your argument, I'm, I'm theoretically in good company uh, building on what has gone before. As I said, I don't necessarily know that I'm building better, but I'm certainly, um, and all art is inevitably the product of the time in which it's created. So my Sherlock Holmes, The Return of the Pharaoh, is a product of the year 2000. What is it? 21? Is that what we're in? 2021. <laughs> Hard to tell um, these days. <laughs> you know, I, I heard you say before Victorian era, but the, the return of the pharaoh is not set in the Victorian era, but in the Edwardian era. It takes place more or less in 1911. And so it, it is a... Uh... An amazing, uh, I, I think, amazing work because it's a continuation. Uh, and you, if you're a fan of Sherlock Holmes, and and who isn't, and and or the the mystery itself, um, your writing uh, does harken back to uh, to the the original works. I, I would suggest. And and let's just take a look at a clip just for a moment before I get to my point here to hear that. And I just think it's interesting. I found an 1895 recording through the help of. Uh, in search of with Leonard Nimoy, our, our, our friend, uh, uh, and and they they have a recording here. Let me just hear this for two seconds. It's not really that long, and then we'll have a, a something to build upon with this. Sherlock Holmes's reputation was enhanced by a play about him written by an American actor, William Gillette. Gillette probably played the part of Holmes more times than any other actor. An 1895 recording preserves his performance. How the deuce! Oh, my wife was away. Marvelous, marvelous. Elementary, my dear fellow. Elementary. And I just thought it's it's so interesting to have a recording of a play from 1895. Wow, it is amazing. <laughs> it, it's incredible, and and that's the gentleman that made uh, back in the day. He was he was American, and and he brought this to stage, and and, and it was basically an, it, three years after, from what I understand, the original or the first publication of a Sherlock Holmes story. So I, I guess what I'm harking back to is, can you imagine being uh, in, in the genesis of Sherlock Holmes and seeing it in, in writing and then on stage and look where it is now and it's still to this day the subject of uh, television shows, <clears throat> the subject of movies, and your five books uh, really, uh, I think, uh, are some of the best representations, and, and maybe books are always the best representation for, for this kind of thoughtful character. But still, um, can you explain in some way how this character still uh, is, is so popular from, wow, 1895, I can't do the math, but that's 1995, that's, that's like, you know, 130 years. How is he still well, so, char so popular? I'm not good with numbers, but I do know that the first Sherlock Holmes story appeared in the Beaton's Christmas Annual of 1887. And that was the, a study in Scarlet. It wasn't until he started publishing the short stories in the Strand magazine that he really sort of hit his stride. Um, Doyle kept trying to kill him off because he was more heavily invested in his historical novels and his science fiction. He wrote the original sort of version of uh, the Lost World. It was called The Lost World about dinosaurs still roaming around, and it was sort of the precursor to King Kong, and, and he did these historical novels, The White Company, and um, and he thought Sherlock Holmes uh, uh, as a sort of lesser endeavor that had paid a lot of uh, bills when he was a doctor and waiting for patients to show up who didn't. Um, but now that he was well-to-do, he wanted to kill him off, uh, and at one point when uh, William Gillette, the American actor, uh, wanted to make a play about him and, and sent a telegram to Doyle saying, uh, can I marry Holmes? And, and 
Holmes, uh, Doyle wrote back and said, you may marry him or murder him or do what you like with him. <laughs> um, and certainly, I think after Hamlet and, and possibly Don Quixote, these are the three most popular fictitious characters ever created. And, and, and it's, it's just stunning to, to, I don't know, to just think about uh, that this character is, is, exists to this day and is alive and well. And I'm telling you, you got to get involved with the prior book was great, too. The, when Nicola, uh, Nicholas Meyer was on our show about two years ago, a year and a half, The Adventure of the Peculiar Protocols. We'll talk about that for a few moments. But also The Return of the Pharaoh out this week, Amazon and everywhere else. We'll be back right after this with Nicholas Meyer and everything old new again. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Thirty-three centuries had passed since human feet last trod the floor on which we stood. And yet the signs of recent life were around us. A half-filled bowl of mortar, a blackened lamp, the chips of wood left on the floor by a careless carpenter. So gorgeous was the sight that met our eyes. A golden effigy of the young king of magnificent workmanship filled the whole of the interior. Welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. We are here with Nicholas Meyer, and that was a uh, little clip from Howard Carter. And he's the gentleman that discovered King Tut's tomb. And that relates certainly to the latest work. Uh, a Sherlock Holmes mystery by Nicholas Meyer, The Return of the Pharaoh. And uh, before I ask a question, Paul Giamatti talks about Nicholas Meyer's Sherlock Holmes novels and says since he was a boy, his latest, uh, well, he's been a, a fan since he was a boy, and his latest, which is, of course, The Return of the Pharaoh, takes me right back there as a child. He, a dazzling blend of perfect period detail, Egyptology, murder, spies, treasure, mummies, spot-on Holmesian banter, and one of the best action sequences I've read in a long time makes for another incredibly satisfying read from Paul Giamatti. Uh, let's uh, ask Nicholas Meyer himself to just give us the what do they usually say this the elevator pitch or the the short term without any without any spoilers, of course, uh, for the return of the Pharaoh. The return of the Pharaoh uh, finds Holmes in Egypt, having been hired um, to track down a, a, a British nobleman who has disappeared. Uh, in 1911, 1910, the early part of the 20th century, a lot of people who went to Egypt for their health, for its dry air, people with consumption, people with all kinds of health issues uh, who would winter in, in Egypt, got caught up in the new hobby of uh, treasure hunting, Egyptology. Uh, which really amounted half the time to a kind of looting of a country's uh, national sort of patrimony. And a lot of English noblemen, some of whom were more responsible than others. You mentioned Howard Carter a minute ago. Howard Carter uh, was an Egyptologist, largely self-taught, who worked for Lord Carnarvon, and who went searching for, for, for tombs. And in 1922, he astonished the world by finding the only tomb that had never been robbed, an unopened tomb, which was uh, Tutankhamun's treasure. And that, that made him famous and ushered in a whole rage for universal movies called The Mummy and a lot of fun stuff like that. Um, and so Holmes is in Egypt looking for a nobleman who has gone missing, along as it turns out with several other archaeologists who have mysteriously been killed. And that's the setup. 
and it uh, it goes from there without uh, uh, giving any uh, anything away or spoilers. I'm going to harken back to the adventure of the peculiar peculiar protocols to talk about, generally speaking, the way that you present the character of Sherlock Holmes in your work. Uh, in in the peculiar protocols, uh, the the character uh, uses at some point uses pepper, uh, uses a kick and a nerve pinch peculiar to the Japanese form of combat called uh, baritsu, which Holmes uh, is considered a master by by uh, Watson. Um, and I love this; it, it presents what I think, as a fan of Sherlock Holmes, a little more authentic uh, Holmes than some of the other incarnations you see, especially Basil Rathbone and some others where he's just a thinking guy. Well, you know, he's he's more of an, I think, you tell me, a more of an adventurous soul. Uh, of course, he, he, of course, goes undercover in uh, in The Return of the Pharaoh as well and and uh, uses disguises. So there's a lot to this character more than, than just somebody with a pipe uh, solving mystery with his brain, so to speak. Am I wrong or is that uh, something that you intended to do? Um, let's just see if I interpreted that correct. Well, I think there's a large measure of correctness. You asked me uh, before the break, and I I didn't uh, really answer why I thought this man's popularity had endured over such a long period of time. And I think that the Holmes stories take place in a world which seems to us simultaneously long enough ago, far enough ago, to have a kind of fairy tale-like quality to it, while at the same time being close enough to our own time to have a lot of recognizable things, whether you're talking about telephones or or uh, you know, cars or carriages, things that, that we recognize. And it's this interesting tightrope of uh, what is contemporary and what is sort of mysteriously historical, fairy tale like however, that that m- makes it a sort of um, his era, if you like, uh, attractive and and yet mysterious, familiar at the same time. I also think one should not underestimate his ability as a thinking machine. I think it's his most intriguing quality. There are lots of action heroes. There are superheroes. I'm sick to death of superheroes. I just want heroes for a change. See what they're like. And he's he's he has frailty. He gets things wrong. There are cases he doesn't solve. There are conclusions that are incorrect. Um, and he has a drug problem, uh, which presumably he's kicked. And according to the seven percent solution and an explanation of of how he became a drug addict and also how he kicked it. But he was addicted to cocaine a 7% solution. Um, so he's he's relatable as a human being. I think a lot of times we confuse heroes with gods. We want people to be perfect, flawless, no feet of clay. But that is, I think, seldom to be found and seldom to be believed if it is found. What is a paradox? A paradox is an irreconcilable contradiction with which we are nonetheless forced to live. So, and it's, it's, it, it's, it's a horrible uh, dilemma to learn that great men or great women are not always good men and good women, and they're not perfect. And I think Holmes's imperfections are part of what makes him flaws, uh, plausible. And, and realistic, right? Exactly, and and the use of his uh, other other capabilities besides using his intellect, which of course I, I would suggest when he was created was was sort of a brand new situation. I think we had uh, Edgar Allan Poe create the the detective novel with the murders of the Rue Morgue, and, and I think. I think that was the first, but but it was only one of those. And then from there, we've gotten to a Sherlock Holmes where yeah, the intellect is important. But also, there's no doubt that you introduce, in some ways, his ability to uh, to maybe maybe uh, have invented Russian roulette or at least use that in the prior book uh, to to uh, you know to kind of get a, uh, a confession or at least information from a character and uh, I think it's 
you know, it's it's important to know that he was, like you say, well-rounded, not just someone that, you know, that's just using the intellect, which is not to be underestimated. Uh, but also, I guess we could say this, in my world, he doesn't necessarily, I think he does have an ego, yes, but I don't think he necessarily thinks of himself as a hero all the time. It almost seems to be like, uh, like he says, the game is afoot. It's almost, you know, he's so intellectual. Uh, this is just kind of fun for him in some ways. Is it not to, to solve the, or something that drives him? He almost needs to do this. And whether he's a hero or not while solving these problems is kind of irrelevant. I just want to solve this mystery or this puzzle. Does that make sense? Yes, I think, uh, you, well, you've raised a number of issues, so I'll try to talk quickly. Uh, I don't think he thinks of himself as a hero, but I think he is certainly not without vanity. Right. Um, in choosing Watson as his companion, he is not, as the movies depict, you know, which is why I can't stand the Basil Rathbone movies, mm -hmm. he's not choosing to hang out with an idiot. Right. Um, he wants to hang out with a... Watson is a regular person. He is not a... A, a jerk. He's he's not a fool. He's a regular person. He's us. We're supposed to identify with him. And Holmes is is and Watson says it. Holmes is not without vanity. It's not that he sees himself necessarily as a hero, um, but he does take pride in his brain and his ability. Doyle also specifies that he is extremely athletic. He's a very good boxer. He's a single stick player. He, he's done all those things. Um, so he's a man of many parts. But to go to another point that you raised, I don't think Poe is the first detective story. I think Oedipus hmm. is the first detective story. Oedipus is the detective who goes out to solve the murder of King Laius. Who killed him? Oedipus uh, asks many witnesses. He questions them. And all the witnesses he questions say, don't put your nose in this. Stay out of it. If you know what's good for you, don't go into this. But he he refuses to be deterred. And he learns that, and this is a, a twist worthy of Agatha Christie, that the murderer he is looking for is himself. Mm. That's a detective story. And it's way older than Poe. I lo that's why I love talking to Nicholas Meyer, because he gives us so much more depth uh, than we could ever do on our own here. And, and unfortunately, we have to take a break, but we will be back right after this to continue with uh, Nicholas Meyer talking about the return of the Pharaoh and more. Everything old is new again. Now, back to America's Entertainment Pop Culture Talk Show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. What a devious little creature you are, to be sure. You put me in mind of St. Augustine's observation that the innocence of children is due less to the purity of their hearts than the weakness of their limbs. So, Willie, let me and you be wipers of scores out with all men, especially pipers. And whether they pipe us free from rats or from mice. If we promise them what, let us keep our promise. Uh, welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. We have kept our promise here by uh, making radio fun again. And uh, guess what? Nicholas Meyer is here with us uh, to help us to do that and always does that with us. He is the author right now of the latest uh, Sherlock Holmes book that you've got to get involved with. It's out this weekend. It's um, ready and, and re to go in Amazon and all the bookstores. The Return of the Pharaoh. Uh, we've got a mix of Sherlock Holmes and Watson with Howard Carter and Egyptology and so much more. It's a, a great book. Let's take a look a little bit into the mind, if I can, of Nicholas Meyer, the author of that book. Uh, that was just a little bit of a 1985, and, and this is my wife's, one of my wife's favorite show. I had to buy all the DVDs for Fairy Tale Theater. And one of them, one of the episodes was The Pied Piper of Hamelin, which, uh, which was written, or we'll say adapted, uh, by Nicholas Meyer and certainly directed by Nicholas Meyer. And that was Eric Idle in the beginning of the, the episode and at the end of the episode. And, and they're looking into and expanding upon the Robert Browning poem from the Middle Ages, The Pied Piper. And you may not remember the story because it's, I think it's been sanitized sometimes through uh, time. And if you watched the fairy tale theater episode 
which is, I think, uh, really nicely done. It tells the story, which is not always a wonderful story, but a great lesson, as you heard at the end there, of when you promise something, uh, be honest and stand by your promise. Otherwise, bad things can happen. And I'll leave that to you to watch and go back to Fairy Tale Theater and watch that episode. My question for the, uh, the director and writer, let's say, of that episode is that uh, do you agree that it seems to me that your imagination and creativity is somewhat grounded in the classics like this, and you put uh, you you put quote in there like from Saint Augustine, which I don't think is in the Robert Browning poem, into this episode, <laughs> <laughs> into this episode, and and kind of did a mashup as they call it today of two different songs together. They call it a mashup. You did a mashup there of classics together that really worked. And it sort of makes it, I don't know, like a melting pot, if you will. And they coalesce together to tell a very meaningful story. And the last part I want to say before I hand this off to Nicholas Meyer is, at the end, it's not a wonderful ending but of the story. But then we get back to Eric Idle, who tells this, was telling this uh, a child this story. And the child has, a t- has tears. And, and then there's a hug between two people that is very meaningful because of this story and the lesson told. And I think as a father to a son, it's very touching and maybe i'm making too much of it but i don't think so i think it was it, it really affected me in that way so i don't know if there's a I know there's a lot i've raised up there for you to bite into but my point being is uh the imagination and creativity that that you bring to your works seems to have some groundings in the classics am i am i on point there well i guess i had what was called a good education uh and that included what well, i guess we generically label the classics um i was a big reader i still am that's my main idea of fun in the daytime uh so i read the three musketeers and Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea and um hg wells and uh, doyle and um and in college you read aristotle you read the greek plays and stuff and um I guess I come from the if it ain't broke, don't fix it school of something. Uh, I got involved in the fairy tale theater. This is a story about how art thrives on restrictions. It's what you when you don't have the money or you don't have the time or you don't do them, that you're forced to be creative. So I got a call from Shelley Duval, who had that television program, the fairy tale theater, and she said, would you like to do the Pied Piper of Hamlin? It's going to be David Bowie. And I said, sure. Um, And I said, on one condition, I said, I really want to do the Robert Browning poem. I I want to do it in verse. And she said, oh, sure, absolutely. She didn't know what she was talking about, and neither did I, because when I pulled the book off my shelves, I realized it's only four pages long. And I called her back. I said, how many pages does this have to be? Um, and she said, well, it has to be, I don't remember, 38 minutes or whatever. I thought, oh, <laughs> hell, how am I going to do? Um, so I wound up writing a screenplay in which I was writing more verses alongside Robert Browning's, which was obviously a pathetic exercise, but I didn't really have a choice. It had to be all in rhyme. And then it, it still wasn't long enough. So I thought, well, maybe we need like a framing story with Robert Browning, because we know this poem was never meant to be published it was written for a little boy the son of a friend who had come to weekend with the brownings at their country house so out of that i made this framing story then it turned out that david bowie couldn't do the show because he wasn't finished with his record wherever he was and at the last minute eric idle whom i knew a little bit agreed to fly to toronto which is where we were filming uh to play the piper And the one thing I was told by Shelley is uh, he has an enormous beard that he's grown (laughs) for some role he's in. And uh, there's we just have to live with the beard. And I thought, oh, no, no, no. The Piper, it says he doesn't have a beard. No tuft of hair on beard or whatever. I said, this is going to be crazy. He's going to look like that guy there going by us in the hotel, which was Eric Idle. (laughs) Um, And. Then, you know, when I met him and I sat down with him and he goes, now, what do you want to do about the beard? And I said, well, what what can we do? We'll just, you know, just 
you know, have to live with it. Then he goes, well, you could cut it off. And I said, what do you mean cut it off? We were told by Shelley Duvall that this was grown for a role. And you just, he said, no, no, it was grown while I was writing something. You can do whatever you want with it. Oh, wow. And then I had my total brainstorm. I said, you're not only going to play the Piper, you're going to play Robert Browning in the framing story because he had a beard. You look like Robert Browning. And so this whole thing became an exercise in, again, ingenuity, skinning the cat. Uh, maybe not a good image. But anyway, so we shot the Robert Browning stuff with Eric and his beard. And then we shaved off the beard and he became the Pied Piper of, of Hamlin. And, and uh, it became this sort of father son or father child uh, story. And, and it's very memorable and so well done. I, I, I gee, I may have missed um, the fact that that he wasn't supposed to be uh, actually Robert Browning, but that really adds another uh, depth to it as well, which I really enjoy. Part of that, let's put it this way: that was done, and I know it was it's been done before also, but that was done two years before Princess Bride. But it's still um, Princess Bride did the same thing with Peter Peter Fork, where uh, you know grandfather's father's reading and telling a story uh, to a child, and. Um, and in some way, you know, I know your modesty, you're not going to uh, take credit for that, certainly. And it is an idea that's existed before. But I think that you did it so well there. I just wonder, I would never know the answer if that in- influenced uh, Rob Reiner or anybody to, to do that again. But it is a very touching way to tell a story. It's a nice way to tell a story. And finally on that is... Um, you didn't hold back on the story. Sometimes uh, it's not fair to say Disney, but just to, to get a message, you know, Disney t- tells these these old uh, tales. Uh, it might be the Princess. Bra- how am I saying? It might be the uh, Little Mermaid and so forth. And they change Snow White. They change and sanitize the endings. And you didn't do well, fairy that. Fairy tales. Here. Fairy tales. There's a very interesting book about fairy tales called The Uses of Enchantment. And the Uses of Enchantment is by a man named Bruno Bettelheim. And basically, I think the point of his book is that fairy tales are a way of preparing children for the hazards of life. And they don't clean up things. They don't sanitize them. They are sort of parables and tales of of good and evil that are meant to, in, in a way, introduce children to the perils of the world, also the joys of it, but also the perils. Um, and it never occurred to me to, to clean up the story. I was going to do Robert Browning's poem, period, the end. And and that's what I love about it, because it, it does, it's supposed to tell a message. You know, it's supposed to have a significance. It's supposed to affect you so that you remember the message. You remember the story as a child. If everything is just a happy ending, it sort of goes, you know, on the shelf and you kind of forget that. So, uh, I don't know, that's just my thought on it. And uh, just an idea, I just want to play a smidge of time after time here, and then we'll expand from that in a moment. A 19th century gentleman and a 20th century woman join forces to capture a criminal from the past at large in the modern world a romantic adventure a breathless chase around the world and across a century time after time we're here with the the author and director of that tremendous film we, we talk with have an adventure with hg uh, wells and, and jack the ripper but of course time is up here and we need to take a break we'll be back right after this with nicholas meyer and everything old is new again This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. We are back here on Everything Old is New Again with Nicholas Meyer. We left off talking a little bit about time after time, and let's amplify that. It's expanding upon that, in, in your prior book, Sherlock Holmes' book, The Adventure of the Peculiar Protocols, you do slip in a number of quotes, as, as you like to do, which I love. And, and one was, uh, the first man who raises a fist has run out of ideas, from, of course, from H.G. Wells. Um, obviously, you're an H.G. Wells fan, uh, but 
th- in this particular case, I don't think there re- was even a nod to that that was an H.G. Wells quote, and uh, certainly it's a famous quote, um, and I love that, that you just uh, throw it in there in the middle of the story, and then the story continues. Um, you're very, uh, you know, well-rounded with, with all of all of these, these quotes and things. Is there um, a, a reason that you, uh, I don't know, enjoyed H.G. Wells so much, or just the quotes in general to, to do that and put that into these into these great books well with regard to the line that you mentioned i don't know who said the first man who raises a fist is the man who's run out of ideas it just seemed like hg wells's character ought to say that at that moment in the story i wasn't trying to uh, be fancy or highfalutin it just what the 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 woman in the story is suggesting that they go buy a gun to beat Jack the Ripper, and he he doesn't want to do that, and he says because he's not a violent person, and he says the first man to raise a fist is the man who's run out of ideas. I don't know who said it. For all I know, it was me. Mm. Um, so, you know, in, in my Star Trek movies, um, Shakespeare gets a lot of. Uh, airtime for the simple reason well two reasons one is he's not copyright (laughs) so you can just help yourself same with herman melville you just grab and in the case of shakespeare what i have concluded is that i have never had a thought and i suspect neither have you that this man did not express first and better so why should i strain myself looking to, you know, recycle something that's already been perfectly expressed. Um, So that's the origin of my of why I appear to do a lot of citing or quoting. Um, It's just to help me get my ideas or points across as they seem to be required in the stories that I'm working on. And I'll tell you, it, it it works, and it's it's very reminiscent, believe it or not, of our show. Um, we've had over 400 now, and, and I use quotes all the time, as you can hear, and clips and so forth, because certainly these, I, just saying the the quote or saying, uh, let's just say, you know, gee, time at the time is wonderful, and here's why, is not as good as listening to others that have have perfected the trade and and and, uh, and either acted uh, certain lines or, or done a promo, what have you. So I totally relate to that. I think it's a it's certainly makes sense. Um, and, and just expanding upon that uh, a little bit, and we'll get back to because I really want to talk about again the return of the Pharaoh with Nicholas Meyer, which is out this weekend, and it's a great book that uh, it dives into Egyptology. And uh, and Sherlock Holmes's adventure with that as a background, um, but it, it just because we are Star Trek fans, we have to ask one question at least. And uh, <laughs> Star Trek Four: The Voyage Home. From what I understand, uh, you had said in the past, and I hope I'm not wrong about this, that that what uh, was most fun for you was to do the and write the San Francisco part of that movie because you were able to do some scenes from time after time that you weren't able to you know, that were written, let's say, for time after time, or at least thought about, and and unable to to include in that movie. Is that true? And if so, can you give us a little insight as to what scene or two may have related to time after time in the Star Trek movie? Oh, sure. Um, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, is is another time travel movie, although instead of coming from the past to the future, it's the Star Trek people in the 23rd century coming to the future, into the present um but in both cases for reasons beyond my control they wind up in san francisco i when they told me you know and i write the part on earth harv bennett the producer wrote the bookends of the movie in outer space and uh, so my first line in the movie somebody says when are we and the other person says judging from the pollution content in the atmosphere i'd say we're in the late 20th century at which point Kirk says, everybody remember where we parked. Right. (laughs) Um, And I I didn't want it to be San Francisco because time after time was, you know, I said, can't they go to Paris? And I was, you know, or someplace fun, you know, and uh, they said, no, because 
the whales wouldn't fit in the River Seine or something like that. So there I was in San Francisco. Um, but it's true, there were parts in Time After Time that were not only written but filmed. Hmm. That for one reason or another, and I'll give you the example you asked for, um, I had to cut out of the movie. Remember that Time After Time was the first movie that I ever directed, certainly first feature film. And I made my more than my share of mistakes. And so I had a scene where Wells is trying to cross the street again. He's already caused one traffic accident, and he now knows to pay attention to the flashing sign that says, don't walk. So there he is stuck with the don't walk sign. And a Chinese youth stands next to him with a ghetto blaster. And it's it's playing something horrible. And he would really Wells like to escape by crossing the street, but it says, don't walk, don't walk. So he's obliged to, to, to endure this. And then later, when he's at dinner with our heroine for the first time, and they're getting to know each other, and she says, what kind of music do you like? And he thinks about it, and he says, anything but Oriental. <laughs> um, and I thought this was killingly funny. Everybody else who read it thought it was killingly funny, except the audience. And the reason was that so much time had passed between the Chinese boy on the street corner and the dinner with the girl that everybody didn't know what he was referring to anymore. They just they couldn't keep it in their head. So I thought, well, maybe I can still keep the the rock and roll part and just cut out the punchline at dinner. But I didn't really film it right. It, it, uh, you know, it was amateur night, so I had to lose it. But when I did Star Trek IV, um, there's a moment on a bus going across, I think, the Golden Gate Bridge, where Kirk and Spock are riding on the bus and discussing great literature, Jacqueline, Suzanne, etc. And this punker across the way, or whatever he is, has got a boombox, and uh, Sp Spock silences him with the Vulcan nerve pinch. And that was a holdover, obviously, from time after time and i'm sure there were others and uh, that's a, that's great insight we we love to hear things like that from nicholas meyer the author of return of the pharaoh and i just want to read a little something here that is from a friend michael elias author of you can go home now we are indeed fortunate that nicholas meyer keeps sherlock holmes and dr watson alive and well and writes them better than anybody else set in egypt in 1910 in his witty and thoroughly delightful Return of the Pharaoh, the pair confront tomb robbers and treacherous English aristocrat aristocrats in Cairo, Luxor, and the Valley of the Kings. This latest es escapade is a tight and suspenseful as any contemporary th thriller, and um, I, I just think that that's a, a great way to, to put this in terms of where we are and, and what is happening in this book there's an ending in this book that is uh, a page turner for sure i don't want to even talk too much about the specifics of this book so i'll sometimes go back to uh, the prior book that you wrote the adventure of the peculiar protocols and and i just want to quote that and i'll leave this for a moment let's just see when we come back if you can answer this uh, but in the Adventure Peculiar Protocols, you wrote something that struck struck me as, uh, I don't know why, it just was something I wanted to quote here <laughs> and show the type of writing that you're going to get here. This is not just a straight writing without any prose, without any interesting uh, descriptions. Every page that Nicholas Meyer puts uh, the words uh, to paper uh, is got some interesting concepts, and the way he presents the ideas are very interesting in The Return of the Pharaoh. Uh, here's a quote, The Spiders. Long legs thwacked the paper in an otherwise silent room. Let me see our time here. What I'm going to do is going to leave that to you and uh, listeners and uh, of everything all those who can try to think about that quote and what exactly is he describing? The spider's long legs thwacked. 
<laughs> the paper in an otherwise silent room. Let's see what he was referring to. We'll be back next week to answer that question with Nicholas Meyer, author of The Return of the Pharaoh. It's out now, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever you want to go to get it. And while you're at it, heck with it. Pick up, they do those bundles. Pick up The Adventure of the Peculiar Protocols. It's well worth your time to read both. And it's just uh, fun, but also thought-provoking, and also uh, it's literature in my my view. We'll be back right at this and everything old is new again. Hi, this is Walter Koenig, and you're listening to Everything Old is New Again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohn. This is Terrence Winter, writer and executive producer of The Sopranos, creator and executive producer of Boardwalk Empire and The New Vinyl on HBO. And you're listening to my friends Douglas Viviani and David Cohen on Everything Old is New Again. Hey, it's Dr. Peter Weller. I'm here with my friends David Cohen and Douglas Viviani on Everything Old is New Again, one of my favorite shows. And I may, I may not be the most interesting man in the world, but I'm one of them. You've been listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's pop culture entertainment talk show. Find us on the web at everythingoldisnewagain.biz. That's dot biz. See you next week. Same bad time, same bad station.